So I just want to jump into this and, and, and look at how we're going to, what can we do for best practices in, in, in Glyphworks. Some of this I'm going to show in PowerPoint, some of this we'll do live. Some stuff is just a lot easier to do live, right? So let's get started here. First off, top tip of the day. Debug.air can be used from simple rqp.ovl files to produce quite complex batch lines, having access to rqp arithmetic manipulation. You got that? <laughs> All right, so we're going to go to the next one. No, okay. <laughs> Who, has anyone ever seen this before? Who are the old school guys in this room? Okay. What is RQP? Report quality plotter. Yep. So uh, this, believe it or not, this is actually not your top tip of the day. This is your trip back in the way back machine. This is just a trip down history. Down, uh, down, uh, Old Lang Syne, I guess, Old Lang Syne, Lang Syne's fake sake. This is a tip from NSoft, believe it or not. How many people here have used NSoft? Yeah, old school. This is good, okay. So if we had a user group meeting uh, 12 years ago, we'd be talking about NSoft. But Glyphworks and Design Life have effectively replaced that, so now we can just look back and laugh at it instead. So um, there used to be, when you started NSoft, a little pop up screen that said, hey, did you know? You know, and, and this would pop up before you started NSoft. So in other words, you could look at a tip or you could run NSoft. You'd never do the, same, do the two at the same time. So in other words, you could take that information right there to remember it or write it on a piece of paper and then use it in NSoft. So it seems like an odd way to get a tip. And not to mention the tips are mostly about batch lines and you can use a slash up and such and then you can also type this other three letter acronym and you know, it all, ugh, you know, it's nasty, okay? So we're, we're not doing that. That's old. That's old. So we'll try to focus on you know, I've heard today drag and drop is a good thing, and interface, this and that, and so on. So there's a more modern version of top tips than this. So moving on to that, connecting glyphs. Has anyone noticed a change in the way you connect glyphs in ENCODE 9.1? Anyone notice this? What's weird about that glyph there on the left, on the, excuse me, on the right side? The arrow is not pointing to a pad, and the glyph has got a red header bar, okay? Which, if you've never connected glyphs together, you're probably saying, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about, Kurt. And I totally understand that. So let me just show you what this looks like live. Go over here. Okay, so let's say we had a process like this, where we had time series data, and that data went to a frequency spectrum calculation. We're talking about vibration. There you go. That's how you do that. And then we have this XY display glyph, like this. How do we connect them together? Left click to start a pipe. And then now what's new in 9.1 is if I go anywhere near this glyph, it lights up in the color of pad that it will connect to. And anywhere I click on it, it'll finish. So I don't need to go find a pad. Yeah, ooh, yeah. Let's, let's try that in slow motion. Here we go. Uh, I'm not going over there. I'm going over here. Yeah, look at that. I'm out to see it. Thanks for you. You've been a great audience. Yeah, I'm going to leave now. Yeah. So it'll find the next available pad that it could possibly use. If I had another one of these, for example, if I have another one of these, it'll connect into that one. Huh? Yeah? Right? So semi-magnetic, maybe you could say, a little bit adaptive in the way it's trying to connect glyphs. If that's, uh, if that's really exciting, then you've obviously been a long-time user. Um, <laughs> Or there are other personality types that could make that interesting as well, I suppose. Um, just as a reminder, since day one, for a long time, you've been able to connect glyphs this way, by the way. Drag and drop right onto the pad. And now I get the glyph, and it's already connected for me. That is nothing new whatsoever. For those of you that have never seen that before, it was just added in yesterday because you wanted it. Brand new. It actually was added in. It was, came in in glyph, uh, what was Glyphworks version 1. Anyone been around that long to remember the version one of, of Glyphworks? Yeah, okay. So that function of automatically connecting has been around for a long time, um, if you take a look down uh, in history. Anyway, so that was what I was trying to point out here with, um, with uh, what is this automatic glyph connection stuff here. So that's a, that's a bit easier. That's in 9.1. That was not new in 10, but it's new in 9.1. That's a nice little feature. Um, pad tooltips. Sometimes people ask, what on earth is going on with all these pads? Why does a strain life glyph have four input pads and what is that, six output pads? Yipes, what's up with that? So let me explain. So let's grab a strain life glyph here. And just take a look. Strain life glyph is a great example of being able to do just a lot of really interesting stuff 
And because of that reason, it has a lot of properties and has a lot of data flowing in and out of it, or a lot of potential ways we can have data flow in and out of it. So this strain life glyph here, if I take a closer look at it, if I mouse over different pads, if I mouse, let's try it this way instead. If I mouse over different pads, you can see it tells me what's going on there. This is where materials data comes in. If you choose to plug in materials data this way, this is the, pot, the pad it goes to. These outputs, this one's called the damage histogram. This one's called the rainflow histogram, okay? So maybe this isn't even your glyph, but all glyphs pads are named for a reason. Furthermore, all glyphs pads can be renamed. So if you didn't want this to be called rainflow histogram, you can call it whatever you like. Now, we put a little bit of effort into naming it the right thing, you know. There's a reason it's called rainflow histogram. It's not because it's not that. So you may wonder, why would you ever want to rename a glyph? Excuse me, why would you want to rename a pad? Why would you want to rename a pad? Here's what's useful for this. How many people here use studio reports? Okay. To use ENCODE is to, at some point, probably want to use a studio report of some sort, right? So let me show you this. This is not a tutorial on how to use the studio display glyph for making reports. That's just too much for us to do right now in this class. But the key thing is, this is a pad of paper that I can put different types of displays on. For example, I can say I want to put an XY display for time series data on here. Now I've got a little plot for time series data. And maybe I want to put some other different type of display down. I want to put a GPS plot in here. So here's GPS and so on. So the reason why I'm saying this pad renaming concept can be useful is that as I add more displays onto this report piece of paper, I get more pads. And I can see what's connected visually this way. As I mouse over the pads, it shows what's it connected to. But even more important, it gives me a name. It says whatever this pad is, it's called page one display one. In other words, on page one, it was the first thing I ever put in there. Well, page one display one doesn't help me a, a lot personally in remembering names, you know? So I might want to rename this pad to be time series channel one. Now, time series channel one, right? So now I have different names for different displays here. So this is where non-descriptively named pads becoming descriptively named pads can help a little bit to help to figure out plumbing. So top plumbing tip, I guess you could say, for the day. OK. All right, let's move on. What's next here? Multiple workspaces. How many people here have used multiple workspaces? All right, good. This is a good advanced feature of GlyphWorks. And that is that just like in Excel, we can have tabs. Likewise, in GlyphWorks, we can have what we call workspaces. So let me show you how this works. In works with workspaces here, I have this WS1. It might be hard for you guys to see it. It's a WS1 tab. Right-click, Workspace Manager. I want to add a tab. And maybe I'll call this Fatigue Analysis, like that. And maybe I want to rename the first one. I've heard a lot about Data Cleanup today, so let's call this Data Cleanup. OK, so what's going on here on this tab may be entirely different in concept than what's going on in this tab. I can use whatever glyphs I want to anywhere I'd like. For example, I may have, you know, maybe I have something like a time series input glyph on this fatigue tab, and that's connected to a fatigue glyph and, and so on. So I'm doing data cleanup stuff like Ryan was just talking about on one tab. I'm using those results potentially on another tab. If I save this process, all the tabs are saved, like an Excel worksheet, you know, all the a work, a book, I guess, is the actual Excel term for it. Everything's saved along the way for me. Even better, if I have a link between these workspaces, I can have data come out of one workspace and go into the other one. Yeah, OK. So let me show you how that works. But wait, there's more. OK, so here's the deal. So maybe on my data cleanup tab here, maybe I have, uh, I don't know, let's uh, very quickly throw a couple glyphs on here. Maybe I need to do some uh, low pass filter, who knows, to get rid of some high frequency noise. And maybe I also have um, some units conversion of some sort that's going on. 
So I need to convert it from, uh, maybe it's in some stress unit. I need imperial units, something. A anyway, whatever your favorite glyphs are for making squiggly lines look like the right kind of squiggly lines, that's what those glyphs are going to do right there, OK? We'll just pretend that's doing important stuff. What I do, if I want this data here, if I feel this is so important that I can go do my fatigue calculation on it now, I, I want to have this available in the next workspace. And the way I do that is through an output glyph. So we use an output glyph. Whatever format data I have, whether it's PSDs or time series data or whatever your format is, use that type of output glyph. And on this output glyph, this can essentially be my magic wormhole going in to this input glyph. OK, so how do I do that? We're getting closer to the answer of how do I do that. Properties. We have a property here that is called load output files into input glyph. Almost German looking in the number of syllables, <laughs> and number of letters here, right? This actually may have been translated out of English into German and back. This is a verb in German. Yep. To load input files into an input glyph. Output, yeah, that's, that's an actual word. We're lobbying hard to have that included in the dictionary.com next year. So what this means is th this glyph is going to send data where? Where does it send data to? And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pop that. Actually, I could have done it this way. All right, so I'm going to right click on here and select pick glyph. I could type the name of the glyph in there if I wanted to, but why type? When I'm not going to massacre the, the typing, so I might as well pick instead. I'm going to pick a glyph, and it says, what glyph here do I want this output to go to? TS input 1 on the workspace called fatigue analysis. Stick that name in there, say OK, and now I've got a process that when I run it, Well, I, didn't, I told the Unis conversion to do nothing, so it's going to get angry with me. This glyph is telling me I, I should do something. Anyway, this will create an output here. Let me just short circuit this one here. We'll get rid of this entirely. Just for the sake of demo, we'll do this. This writes an output file and feeds it in as an input here. So the link is output from one becomes input of the other. You guys see that? Right? Magic. Smoke and mirrors, you know, all that stuff, you know, flash of lights. Data goes from one workspace to the next. This can be really, really useful, especially when you consider that there are some, some functions you just really want to separate, clean up from fatigue analysis, for example. Furthermore, there are some, some steps where you might want to do, say, if you're doing rainfall cycle counting, right? rainfall cycle count 30 different runs or events. That will produce not time series data, but it would produce rainflow histograms. And I could send them to the next workspace and this is kind of interesting. With a histogram input glyph, this one, I can tell it if there are multiple rainflow histograms in here, I want to combine them by summing. Combine the histograms counts by adding them together. So I can use one workspace with lots of separate data files, collapse down into the rainflow domain or PSD domain or some histogram domain and then have the input of the second workspace pick up those individual results, put them together. So then what's actually being passed in my second workspace is a bunch of rainflow histograms being added together. The second workspace now looks like one big, huge pile of rainflow data. Not a huge pile of time series data. One big, huge pile that could be millions of cycles in some broad spectrum. And then I could do a fatigue calculation with that. Now I'm looking at a duty cycle worth of fatigue calculations instead of a run or a time series event. If you think this is useful, if this is cool, dot, 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 finish that sentence. No, that means you've been using Glyphworks for a long time. I was going to say there are lots of ways you could take that. If, if you think this is cool, then, then what? No, but um, what I mean by this is if you think this is useful, furthermore, there's an option now we added in 9 that says what data file format am I going to use to write out here? All the file formats now we've augmented with a temporary something or other. And what I mean by that is, just like you're used to data flowing from glyph to glyph, hands off, you leave encode, data that flowed glyph to glyph, you never even saw it. Same thing happens here as well. It does, but not for very long. It does, you, don't, you probably won't even see it, 
It won't be there when you're done. When you're done, it'll be gone. So this, to be very literal about this, this creates what's called a T3T file. Instead of S3T or S3H, it's a T3T or a T3H, meaning one of these file formats you're used to, but T means temporary. And when you exit from Glyphworks, it's gone, just like all this data that flows through pipes does as well. OK? Make sense? All right. All right, so that is workspaces. And there's a lot more we could talk about with that. I want to keep moving here. If you have questions, um, probably the best thing you can do. Yeah, there you go. We, we, got, we got the man with the mic. And, and uh, we'll be available afterwards to talk as well. Uh, multiple views. Has anyone used multiple views in Glyphworks? Rory, why did you use multiple views? Yeah, it, it, it's a great example of being able to see different types of data without having to maximize, minimize, and stuff. Let me just start. Let's just do this. Let me actually start an entirely new process here. There's a process, a studio report glyph process I have here that will illustrate this well. Excuse me just a second here. Get some data, and uh, let's take... The SIF file, put it in here. I run this process. This is a studio display glyph here that I configured earlier with all kinds of different displays on it. And, and it may be, you know, this is good report quality data at the end here, but it may be that we have, I don't know, three or five or a dozen or more or maybe even a couple dozen glyphs to get to the right answer. So we may have on screen a long way separating inputs from results. So you may be used to, without views, you may be used to thinking about scrolling over. Oh, there's an the answer. Yeah, there it is. And then to maximize, and like, oh, I can see that better now. But wait a minute, how did I set up this calculation down here? And I need to go over here and scroll back this way. OK, in a second. And then it's this glyph over here, looking at its property. Right? You follow me here? So there's a lot of moving around that I may not want to do. Right? So then th this brings up this concept of, of views. So down here, along with workspaces, we have views. So let me just pop this up. View manager. I want to add a view. And I want to call it, I'll just call it V2, for example. That's uh, military historians will recognize that as being important to British in the world, V2. OK. So now I have, I have tabs down here, just like I had multiple workspaces. Now each workspace can have different views. So if I go from this view here to that view there, yeah, look at that. You like that, Joe? That was good, OK. So we're not quite there yet, OK? But here's the thing. Here's, what's, here's what is nice. On this view, I can do whatever I want independent from the other one. So now I can maximize this. That's my view. Here's the other one. As a matter of fact, I can even go so far as to have this is my first view, just input data. This is the analysis view, and this is the answers. So no scrolling around. That's the whole idea here. Lisa likes it. That's good. Someone's calling to tell you they like it. I think they like it. Let's just listen for a second. They like it. OK. All right. So that's views. What else do we have here? Uh, tiling windows, resizing windows. Let's just uh, yeah, let's do this one together here. Uh, back over here. Um, I know that you guys sometimes struggle for screen space, working with large processes. Some of you guys may have noticed already that we can zoom in and out, right? So we can look at the 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 foot view if you like. That'll help with large, um, large processes. Also, this will turn off all the toolbars, turns it back on. I think you guys have probably used that before. Oh, there you go. That's, that's why we do tips and tricks each year, right? All right, also, all of these windows on the outside can be resized. For example, I am personally very fond of the available data window because I drag data out of it. I also really like the glyph palette over here because that's where I get glyphs from. So I like to have those two, but if I had my way, I'd make them both very small so I can get more of the, the gray space, the workspace out here. So all these can be resized. We can move this and make this smaller and so on. But here's what I really like to do. Now, maybe this is more just a personality test than anything else, but this is what I like. Undock this window. Move it anywhere you like, but it's really cool if you put it over here. If I put it over here, now it will be on top of the available data window. So now I have available data and glyphs, right? Mm, there you go. Or even better, what I like even better than that is if you move it down, 
it doesn't put it on top of it, puts it not just above, but it's going to tile. So now I've got tiled available data in Glyph Palette. Right? That will not, there you go. See, look at that. That should be standard. Okay, interesting. Yeah, where's the product manager? Where'd Paul go? There, Paul, did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, just along those lines further, if you go look under Tools, Settings, Auto Pop Menu, ever, anyone ever use this one? Auto Pop by hand, does anybody use this one? Okay, all right, so what's this do? Auto Pop Menu says that junk on that side goes away unless you go over to it. Right, so if you're not consistently using Rainflow or ASCII Translate or any of these other apps, if you're always inside the workspace of Glyphworks, then who cares about that menu? Now I've got more space. All right, uh, I need to wrap up here quickly. Let me just cover a couple other things really quickly, just really quickly here. Uh, sometimes you get a message that if you open up the properties of a glyph, it'll say, do you want to run the flow up to this point? Anyone have seen this one? To use Glyphworks is to see this message, right? Right? Okay, so what this is asking is, the question is literally, do you want to run up to this point? It's pretty straightforward. Do you want to run up to this point? Sure, why not? Okay, why not? Let's just do it. Right? What this is asking is, this is a glyph that likes to have data in it. Or to put it another way, if it doesn't have data in it, then you scratch your head when you go look at it. You go into the properties and you say, why are there all these blanks? Right? Time series calculators, one I've got here. Time series calculator says, take existing channel data and calculate new functions based on it. Keyword there, existing channel data. So if I were to just open up the properties form of the time series calculator, right from if I just connect everything together, don't run anything, open up its properties form, I would see a bunch of numbers, a little keypad, multiply by eight. But what existing channels can I operate on, right? That field would be blank. So that's why the glyphs that really like to have data in them, there are about probably six of them, those glyphs, if you open them up, will ask, do you want to run up to this point? There's a good reason to say yes to this. You only need to do this the first time, really, or, in, or if you have new data coming through the system, right? If you have new data coming through, new channels and such, then you want to say yes. Otherwise, you, you can say no to this. All right, what else here? Um, there's been a lot of talk today about <laughs> the word damage came up a lot today. The word metadata came up a lot today. Okay, so keep in mind metadata is a clear differentiating, powerful way to differentiate yourself from a beginner Glyphworks, Glyphworks user. An awesome way to add a lot of power into Glyphworks analysis capabilities. You'll see things like this, pound attributes dot mean pound. It's a metadata reference. If you've never seen this before, don't be scared. It's just saying, go look up a number. Don't multiply by a number, look up that number and multiply that by the number. Use that as a property. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're old school, you can type these in. You might know metadata off the top of your head. If you don't, then you do what I'm showing on the right, right side of the, the screen here, right click, pick metadata. You've got a big list. What metadata do you want to use in this property? And that can be very, very powerful to do that. Last thing I'll say today is this. If you ever wonder about all the things you can do with a display, let's display some time series data. Here we have some time series data being displayed. If you ever wonder about how do I zoom, how do, how do I click, you know, what if I, what's the double, triple left click, you know, with the elbow, forehead to palm, you know, what, how do we do, what does that all do? All that is summarized right here in this little control summary. And that just pops up this little thing here that says, here are all the ways that you as a human can interact with that little stupid thing on your desk called a mouse, right? And there's, to be honest, there's some stuff in there that I, I, I'm still learning about. There's some really useful stuff in here. For example, I just learned last Friday, thanks to my colleague Joe here, that if I hold down the X key and click somewhere on the screen, it'll put a cursor on for me, like that, right? And then I, I will get, where'd my little call out go? I was supposed to make a little call out here. Where'd my call out? My call outs went away. Where'd that go? Let's try displaying it this way instead and see if this is any different. There we go. So I, I, I think I must have turned them off in that display there. But anyway, so if I hold down the X key, instead of zooming, I'll actually get a cursor here. 
And this is really nice for trying to point out different operating conditions. You know, like on the hot restart, maybe this was the hot restart of the engine right here, right there. And now I have channel magnitudes at that time. So there are other ways to get cursors in, but X and doing that is a good way. You can also do the same with Y, hold down Y. Now we get a cursor running across in this Y direction. So if I want to say, here's my threshold, 500 microstrain is a big deal. There's my 500 microstrain cursor right there. OK? That's correct, yep. OK, uh, actually, I, I did think of one other thing. I had one last slide here. And that is, along the lines of cursoring, if you ever have, time, if you ever have histogram data, rain flow, histogram, that kind of thing, if you look at it from the top down, this is kind of interesting. If you look at it from the top down view, this view right here, as you mouse over without hitting any magic buttons, no secret codes, no dollar bills, nothing like that, you'll get a little yellow call out box that says, what's the X, Y, and Z combo right there? So if you're looking at a rainfall histogram and you say, how many counts are in that bin? Top view, cursor over it, you'll see this says there are 19 counts in that bin. Yeah, so let's say 19 counts, which is 0.2% of the entire cycle count. That percentage is nice for looking at counts and also especially damage, looking at fatigue damage cycle by cycle. That's a very useful thing. Okay, so that's uh, we, the rest of this is from pre previous user group meetings. Any questions or comments? About <laughs>